Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever struggled with love, particularly in your relationships or marriage, then do we have the couple building show for you. Today I'll be talking with Stan Tatkin, clinician, researcher, teacher, and developer of the psychobiological approach to couple therapy. He's also the author of four books, including his latest, my new favorite couples book, Wired for Love. Today we'll be talking about building, protecting, and not popping the couple bubble so you can diffuse conflict and build a secure relationship. That plus we'll talk about the emote me game, the power of the insula, the orbitofrontal cortex, say that 10 times fast, early birds and night owls, and why it's okay to be annoying, just not threatening. (laughs) So welcome to the show, Stan. Are you ready to shine? Oh, yes. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi, and a mighty (laughs) woohoo! It's so great to have you on the show. Before we dive right into things, I've got to ask, how did you get into teaching Vipassana? Oh, well, I studied with my teacher, Shinzen Young, mm-hmm. uh, when he was here in Los Angeles. And, uh, uh, and then I was a facilitator for him for a short while. But when I was at uh, John Bradshaw Center, I used to work with John Bradshaw back in the day, uh, our hospital meetings in the morning Uh, started off with a community meditation, and I would lead that. Uh, So uh, I've been doing it for a long time. How did you get interested in meditation? That's a whole other story. And you know what? I don't know. Oh, I do know. I do know. This goes back back to the days of flotation tanks. I actually had one. You're kidding. Um, I did. This is one of these Uh, deprivation tanks. That's right. Although I, I, I didn't, that's what they were called, uh, deprivation tanks, sensory deprivation tanks. Yeah. But, but they, it was one of the most incredible toys I ever had. And that's what got me started, actually, because you have no choice uh, in, in a tank like that. Um, uh, it's a really good way to learn your mind. It's a really good way to overcome fears of death uh, because you're like in a little casket like that. Uh, so so I've, only uh, had, I've only known one person to do it. Now, I guess I know two. Uh, a f- dear friend of mine many years ago was a Navy SEAL. and It was part of his training, and they put him in it way too long. W- can oh. you explain for people how it works and what it looks or feels like or doesn't feel like? I, I have a sensory memory of it right now, the smell of Epsom salts and the soaps that I would use when I'd go in. The water is, uh, is about yay deep, um, not enough to drown in, you can't, but it's 800 pounds of Epsom salt solution, so you float. Mm-hmm. The water is heated to skin temperature. There are even speakers inside this thing. The uh, door is, is beveled in its feather light. So uh, you go inside, naked of course, you lie down and you float, you close the door, and so when you say yay high, it's only only a foot high, and you're just laying basically supported on the water. Exactly. You're not touching anything. You're not touching the bottom, the sides. You don't feel, after a while, you don't really feel your body. And you can't see anything pitch dark, and you can't hear anything until the music comes on, whatever you select to wake you up, and uh, or wake you up or notify you. And the idea is not to sleep, of course. The idea is to deal with the complete silence, the complete um, lack of vision and sensory input. And what happens is that there's a thermostat, uh, so to speak, in the back of the brain, in the brainstem, that turns way up. And you suddenly become aware of almost everything. I mean, you do become aware of body sensation. Mm-hmm. And and eventually, one of the things that drives you crazy is any itch you have, because it's, it's a super itch in that environment. So this would be like going out to the quietest place on the planet, and that's what that thermostat does, as opposed to when you go to a party and there's a lot of noise, that thermostat turns way down so as to be able to focus in on certain conversations. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do it. So everything opens way up, and you you no longer can tell the difference between one state and another. Whereas normally when you go to sleep at night or when you're lying in your bed, you're passing through different states of consciousness, you know, uh, going to sleep into a hypnagogic state, coming out into a hypo, hypnopompic state, where here in the tank you can't tell, you don't know. There's no, there's no data point. So suddenly you find yourself lucid dreaming and you are... <laughs> very trippy you are outside of the tank walking i could be talking to you right now just like this and i would think absolutely i am here until i remind myself that i'm actually in a tank 
And then there's wow. these trippy, trippy lights and funnels and light tubes and all sorts of things as I come back into my body and realize that I, w- I, I wasn't uh, th- that I, I, I wasn't actually in the tank in some way. So th- this was a, a great way for me to overcome a lot of fears and anxieties and to work with my body. And so going into Vipassana was a very natural thing once I, a friend introduced me to it. And that's my recollection of how I got into it. There, there are so many different things that come up with this. The first is, and, and I'm a longtime meditator myself. Um, we mentioned briefly or talked briefly off air. I met my wife at, at the Shambhala Meditation Center at Boulder where you have an event coming up. And, and um, so there's a part of me that craves peace and stillness. But the term that comes to mind in thinking about this is panic. <laughs> panic, yeah. You, the interesting thing is because your body is so relaxed, yeah. there's no panic. And I think that's why it's so good for dealing with fears. Um, I think the flotation tank would have been, um, instead of sort of an elitist toy, uh, it might have uh, had more widespread popularity uh, had it come at a different time, perhaps. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very attached to Timothy Leary at the, at the time. Um, and and other uh, kind of um, trippy uh, uh, figureheads, and so I think it gained a certain reputation. I miss my flotation tank. <laughs> it, it it brings up it brings up the second point, and I could see why you would miss it. Which is, correct me if I'm wrong. You have a real hard time not going down the what is consciousness rabbit hole once you've That's been right. exposed to that. That's right. Yeah, it, I think it changed me forever. Uh, I really do. Um, I watch there'll be a big run on flotation tanks in your so audiences. I'll, I'll be looking on eBay after this. <laughs> I, I, I had to get rid of mine because I was at the time single and, and I kept moving it as a, a bear to set up every time. And I was on the second floor of an apartment complex and they said, no, 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 you cannot have that. In the, uh, and, so, uh, and so I, uh, I had to give it up. No. Well, may it come back around to you as the time is right. So l- let's go from there. And, and before we jump, jump into the book and, and all things couples related, um, if I understand, y- you studied under or worked with John Bradshaw and you became interested in infant development and mother and infant and father and infant pairings. I wonder what you, if you could tell us what the draw was there for that. Well, I had a long trajectory. Uh, John was one uh, one stop in that trajectory, but after that, I was a college professor. I was a drug and alcohol. Uh, uh, do, I was a director of a drug and alcohol program. But uh, as a teacher, I was always very interested in uh, in, in child development and, and brain development. And because um, coming out of Bradshaw, I became an expert in something called personality disorders. I was invested in prevention and I wanted to see if starting very early with mother infant pairs or father infant pairs, whether um, we could actually prevent mental illness. Um, and I'm still a strong believer in this. The unfortunate thing is it's very hard to get people to come to treatment. So I, uh, I uh, pivoted to adult pair bonding. Um, at the time when uh, uh, John Gottman's psychobiological papers started to come out, and I was really taken by that, and I found that that infant attachment, uh, secure infant attachment, mm-hmm. has a pretty good one-to-one, you know, in comparison, one-to-one ratio to adult pair bonding, uh, save for the the matter of uh, of of, of uh, asymmetry, right? Um, so in adult pair bonding, you have a symmetrical system here. So, uh, and then I fell in love with it. Uh, and I still feel like I do prevention work. Uh, the, the, actually, the latest book I, I wrote, uh, Wired for Dating, is a book on prevention, on getting people uh, you know, focused on what is a good relationship. And when you're looking for one, what is a good relationship? So I still feel that I'm in the prevention business. I, I love it. And before the last thing I have before we dive into Wired for Love, Jessica is is fascinated by the concept of mindful pregnancy and mindful oh. child rearing and what we can do from really from preconception forward to help build the most the healthiest, most resilient, if that's the right term, uh, baby that you can. I guess there's a better word than build. <laughs> But, build a uh, baby, like build a bear. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, what, what, 
what, not that you can encapsulate it in one thing, but what is one of the, the most important premises that you found in um, healthy child development? I think the resources or the resourcefulness of the parents, that uh, parents that are under constant stress or single parent uh, situations where there's uh, a resource drain because of survival issues um, doesn't bode very well for the child because a baby needs a fully resourced parent to find the baby. And find the baby, I mean, it's a constant process of finding and losing the baby. In the first year of life, we tend to think that the baby leads and the, and the caregiver follows. But once that process begins, baby leading, there's a give and take, there's uh, an, a, a sort of an interactive process where an outsider can't tell who's leading and who's following. But in the first year, the baby leads. And the uh, the, the whoever is taking care of the baby, in this case, your wife, um, she needs to focus on the baby and she needs to be well resourced. Where you come in is you regulating the regulator. You're regulating your wife who's regulating your baby. And but what and does that's, that mean uh, to regulate the regulator? That means that with all the, the the physical you know experiences of having a baby, which for some is a traumatic experience, the body certainly is uh, recovering. Uh, for some people, there's some postpartum depression, but there's still anxiety and having to focus on this this new being. Um, and uh, that caregiver, the person who's really really um, uh, uh, having to mind read the baby, so to speak, um, needs also to be cared for. We can't care for somebody unless we're also cared for. It can't be done in a vacuum. And this is where the secondary parent comes in in the very beginning. So the, the mother is regulating the baby um, by calming it, soothing it, feeding it, figuring out what baby wants, what baby is uh, signaling for. And in order to do that, a uh, mother has to be very well resourced and taken care of. And that's the secondary parent's job. And of course, you know, if it gets very stressful, you need somebody also to help you. It sounds, it sounds like the, the word that comes to mind with the secondary parent is empathy. Empathy and, uh, and a, an awareness that the position of that secondary parent in the very beginning is also is co-parenting. But in infancy, the primary is the one who's doing a lot of the, the work and a lot of the connecting and a lot of the, uh, the, the stuff that, become, that, that sort of forms the basic components of the nervous system as the baby is developing. And so, uh, so instead of feeling pushed out and unnecessary, the secondary parent is extremely necessary in, uh, in still being a partner to his or her girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, whatever. Um, and that that is a function. By, by me taking care of uh, the mother of my baby, I am taking care of the baby. Is, until the baby gets to a certain age and now can handle two parents and it's a whole different situation. That, it's fascinating, and I'm going to have to read the books as we get farther down this rabbit hole. No baby yet for us, but I'm going to have to dive in here. And, and I, maybe every single book out there says this, and I'm unaware of it, but what you just described to me, while it intuitively makes perfect sense, I had never heard before. It shows my, my naivete, mm. but the concept of, of being that lifeline to your, your, the primary, that's huge. Well, your, your listeners may be familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm -hmm. Thich Nhat Hanh has long said that uh, you, nobody who cares for somebody can do that alone. Uh, this is done in a, an environment of, of people who are happy and well-resourced. Um, only then can a community or a family take on a difficult person. So I'm not saying a baby is a difficult person, but there are, there are certain challenges to child rearing, not just as infants, but going up through a young adulthood even. So, uh, so there is something to be said for making sure you're being taken care of if you are a caregiver, either of a sick parent or a classroom or whatever. Um, those people need to be looked after. Thank you. That is per that is thank you. <laughs> Going from there, a perfect segue of taking care of what in the world is a couple bubble? A couple bubble is an idea. 
it's it's you and I decide that we're going to that we are in the foxhole together. It sounds aggressive, but not I don't mean it that way. We're going to be in the foxhole together, and we are going to agree to have each other's backs. We're going to agree to be allies, generals, so to speak, um, executives of our world. And by that, we're we're creating an ecosystem, so to speak, where the water we drink and the air we breathe is is clean because we make it so. That means we don't threaten the relationship ever. We never do that because we understand the consequences of not knowing whether the relationship will exist tomorrow or not. That, that, that's a tremendous resource strain. People get very sick. They have accidents. Terrible things happen when uh, people still let, feel that they're in a perpetual state of audition. So we agree that we're not going to do that. We agree that we're going to become experts on each other. I'm going to know you, and I'm going to study you, and I'm going to be a Michael Whisperer, and you're going to be a Stan Whisperer, um, because we can do that, and because nobody else cares to do this. We accept each other as burdens, which we are, and I take you as my burden, you take me as your burden, and the quid pro quo is that we do these things for each other that nobody else wants to do unless they get paid a lot of money. So basically, we're a semi-permeable um, system that protects our resources from the outside. And we basically move together like, like the people in a three-legged sack, potato sack race. We move together because if one of us goes down, we both go down. And we understand this. This is based on social justice principles of fairness, justice, and sensitivity. We adhere to these principles of true mutuality and of collaboration because that is the purpose of doing this. There is no other purpose. It, it sounds beautiful. The challenge uh, that I hear is that, Stan, you and I, when we were dating, that made a lot of sense. And at that yeah. point, we were protecting that bubble. However, right. once we come into a union, it seems like a collective amnesia often sets in where instead of protecting the couple bubble, our partner becomes in a sense, the enemy. They're the one that I'm fighting against to protect myself in my self bubble. <laughs> right. Well, actually, people really don't start off in a bubble. Um, they start off in infatuation. Mm -hmm. And that creates a, a, a different kind of a bubble. And, and in a way, it's easy because nature is taking care of that for us. When we meet each other, when we're infatuated, when we're in courtship, we're on drugs. And those drugs are there to oxytocin. keep us. Oxytocin. <laughs> oxytocin is just one of them. Vasopressin, mm -hmm. a biggie. Testosterone. That's a real one that really changes our perception and, and, and makes us make poor judgments. Yeah. Um, dopamine, noradrenaline, all these things are cooking. And, uh, and so that's because nature wants us to stick together because we, we don't know each other. We could easily just walk away, right? So... Um, so, so once those those neurochemicals fade away, that ship sails. Now we're with the real people, and at that point, when we start to commit to another person, they become deep family. And what that means is that we begin to become proxies for everyone that came before, um, and for each other. And that's why it's so difficult. Everything I'm attracted to about you, things that are missing in myself, things that I saw, things that I enjoyed, are also combined with things I cannot stand. And sometimes they are the exact same thing. Uh, the thing I love about you is the thing I'm going to fight you on. So we're dealing with a memory system that isn't fully engaged during courtship. What happens, Michael, is that whenever we come across something novel, our brain lights up and we want to know everything. We want to feel, touch, taste everything. You know, we, you learn to ride a bike and it's exciting, it's scary. But after a while, it's, it, that, that whole process becomes automated so as to make way for new novelty. Otherwise, we would never do anything new again. So the same thing happens with our partners. Um, I see my, you know, my, my current wife, the first time I see her, she's uh, so novel, so new, I want to know everything about her. I'm going to automate her soon, and she's going to automate me soon. What happens is that we think we know each other at that point, and we're operating almost 100% by memory, and we're making a lot of errors. Uh, we're anticipating uh, judging uh, because the brain goes very, very fast. Real time is too fast. And now we're acting uh, in an automated way and making all these errors. 
you know, all these assumptions. And that's basically the, the human condition. That's nature. And, and, and that sounds like a train wreck waiting to happen. So, it could be. I mean, if you're taking somebody that you love and you're attaching to them all of the baggage of if you had anything but the perfect parents growing up or if there's anybody right. else that you loved, you have, a t- you, you, you have those same hooks or labels and you're putting that on them too and then you're saying that we think very quickly or it's almost that we don't even think very quickly, like you say, it's dumb Vegas, and, yeah. and we just make instinctual decisions on autopilot based on reference points that have nothing to do with the person we're in front of. Right. You have to understand it's, 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 it's both a feature and a bug because <laughs> the feature part is um, we can't possibly stay attentive and present to something um, that isn't novel uh, because it takes us away from other aspects of life. Mm-hmm. And so the, we, the brain loves shortcuts. That's what we do. We do everything by shortcuts. And sometimes that's really efficient, right? It's really good. But you can understand that in the area of communication, in the area of appraising what a face is doing, in the area of memory even, shortcuts can be a very dangerous thing um, because people are making mistakes all the time without ever even knowing it. They know it. Um, eventually sometimes, but it's happening even right now between us. Um, there is no communication without error. There is no memory without non-memory elements in it. There is no perception that is actual. It's always being changed by our state. That, that makes sense. So before we go into the, the warring, loving brain and some of these smart and not-so-smart elements to it, from day number one, well, I guess you can't be from day number one. <laughs> as soon as you are a couple, perhaps, how do we start to um, share these guidelines? Some things like, I will never leave you. I will never frighten you pers- purposefully. When you are in distress, I will relieve you, even if I'm the one causing the distress. How do we start to get those guidelines in place? Well, there's one or two ways. Either we saw it in our parents because they, they comported themselves in this manner, or we saw it in a mentor couple or some other couples that we admire or through a book or a movie. Sometimes it's through therapy, and other times it's through a long run of, of having a bad relationships and finally getting tired of it and saying, okay, I, I, no more of this. I want to do this correctly. You find somebody else. Let's not do this. Let's do this only. And people come to it then naturally. Or you read a book like mine, and uh, that, 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 helps you, that helps you understand what the human animal is and what it isn't, and what is actually normal for us. It has nothing to do with pathology, nothing to do with good or bad. It mm-hmm. just is. It's nature. And to begin to understand the nature of, of the mind and how two different brains and minds have to be negotiated. Um, but there's not a lot of education out there about how to do relationship. And, and then we have to start talking about it. We have to, to open up. That's probably a scary thing to get those guidelines, get those, that line of communication established early with, with protocol. You're early in a relationship. You may be in, in the honeymoon phase. And to say, hey, it's sort of like whipping out a prenup. I, w- <laughs> I want to start to look at how we can build this even stronger. I guess if you phrase it that way, it could be ro- uh, sort of romantic. It could be romantic. I think, when, you know, we're going to talk about secure functioning at some point. I think a couple bubble has to do with secure functioning. Um, there is an aspect of secure functioning, which is basically a social idea, a contract that you and I are different people, but we're going to we're going to protect each other. We're going to make agreements that are good for both of us based on, on, on common principles of survival and thriving. And we're going to do that. The idea of secure functioning is really being an adult and, and, and realizing the separateness of, of uh, our partner, the differences of our partner, enjoying the differences and accepting them, uh, and being able to work with them instead of complaining. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, I know how to move you around, Michael. I know how to get you to do things without using fear, threat, or guilt. Um, I'm, I've become, I have your owner's manual. I've become a master at you, and you have with me. And this engenders a tremendous amount of feeling competent, of confidence, and when two people are willing to do this, first they have to get the idea that this is important. And they're willing to do this, everything changes. It really does. 
fantastic. Let's go from there, and then let's, let's go back to the beginning. I love this beautiful quote with the beginning. Let's talk about the brain specifically. I love this quote. Unfortunately, the parts of our brain that are good at keeping us from being killed are also quite stupid. Shoot first, ask questions later is the basic credo. Yes, that's our primitives. That's the part of our brain that's automatic, that, uh, that has its ear to the ground, that's nativistic, that's survivalist, and it's involved in love and sex and food and all that great stuff, but it's also involved in war. And we are, if nothing else, good at staying alive as a species. And so we have a lot of our brain dedicated to sweeping the environment for dangerous faces, movements, um, voices, words, uh, phrases, all of that stuff. And that can easily override any feeling of love and affection. So we have to watch out for that. So when we're talking about the primitives, we're talking the amygdala, the hypothalamus, pituitary and adrenal glands, the dorsal modal vagal complex. Actually, tell us about the dumb vagus for a minute. Ah, okay. Well, this is really techy. So here we go. There is, uh, we have uh, t uh, cranial nerves in the back of the head and the 10th, we have 12, the 10th cranial nerve is the longest running nerve in the body. It goes all the way from the base of the brain, the brain stem, down, enervates the lungs, enervates the throat, by the way, and larynx, the heart, it, it uh, regulates the heartbeat and the mm -hmm. speed and the viscera. And so this um, vagus nerve, right? Think of Las Vegas, except it's spelled differently. Uh, this vagus nerve has several branches to it. One of them is uh, is a holdover from our reptilian brethren, the lizard, and uh, it is unmyelinated. It's it's global and it's not very smart. This vagus nerve is is um, involved in down regulating me or let's put it another way it's the rock that holds the balloon down that otherwise i would accelerate i would become manic i would be impulsive i would not be able to stop myself slow down i wouldn't be able to socially engage without it so um it actually the governor puts the, it's the governor it's a it's sort of a break it's a breaking it's actually a uh, there's a term called vagal break mm -hmm. and so this this vagus system is very sensitive to life threat very sensitive to situations whereby I can't fight or I can't flee. And if I can't do that, this system takes over my body and massively lowers my blood pressure, massively downregulates me where I am able to still like a bunny rabbit um, playing dead. Okay, so this has survival you know, uh, uh, aspects to it. But when it engages fully, we get nauseous, we get faint, sometimes we do faint, um, uh, you know, we collapse, basically. And this system is the same system when we feel shame, mm -hmm. we, we, co we collapse. It's the same system when we get our blood drawn or we, we cut ourselves and we see inside our skin, it'll trigger that, that vagal complex that thinks we're bleeding out and it will slow our heart rate, it'll drop our blood pressure and we could faint. That's called a vasovagal reaction. By the way, it's the same mechanism that's involved in um, uh, in what's called blood loss phobia uh, on the uh, field. You know, when people are uh, at war, if you get shot, uh, you have to slow your blood rate down, your heart rate down, rather, and your blood pressure so you don't bleed out. Mm -hmm. And it's the same as um, as the broken heart syndrome. We hear about people dying from broken heart syndrome. It's that dorsal motor vagal, that dumb vagus that can't tell the difference between my body and your body. So let's say, let's say you've had surgery and I have a very sensitive vagal system. I can start to feel like it's my body that got cut, not yours. So that's why we call it dumb. It doesn't discriminate. Wow. And it just, it just shuts the whole system down. Let's... Uh, uh, let's let's go from dumb vagal and you give a special nod in here to the insula. Oh yeah, the insula. The insula is uh, is an is it, like it sounds. It's an it's like an, an, an insular island, so to speak, and it crosses across two different uh, lobes, and it's involved in interoception. It's sort of the embodied brain. I you know when you feel your gut feelings, that's the that's the anterior insula, but it's also involved in attachment. And it's also involved, interestingly enough, with the detection or the expression of disgust. People who have a broken insula or the damage in the front there, they may not attach. They may not feel anything in their body. They may not actually respond to 
cues of disgust. They don't show it at all. So it's a very, very important part of the human condition in terms of empathy, theory of mind, um, and also be able to know what one feels. So how do we start to get to know our primitives, meaning these, these part of the brain that can be triggered or tripwired that are then going into an automatic response. It's, it's really how when we talk about warring, how things can escalate so quickly out of control or one second you love the person and then you're just beside yourself in an argument. Yes. <laughs> because you go on autopilot. We are on autopilot and also we're exquisitely sensitive to threat cues. Mm -hmm. Now, by threat, I mean small T threat, not big T threat. I'm not talking about coming after your partner with an ax. I'm yeah. talking about I'm talking about something like this. <sighs> or you're talking to me and I turn away and I walk away. Or I start pointing my finger at you, or I, or I sneer at you, or I, I, you know, I make a face or a sound, tone in my voice, something that is threatening to you. Uh, this is a recognition from other experiences you've had in the past. It's the, the primitives basically are saying, I know this, I know what's coming, and I'm going to do something right now. And th this happens so rapidly that we don't know most of the time, we don't know what we're doing or why. I just want your audience to understand that. That's how the brain works. We don't know what we're doing or why. And in the absence of knowing what we're doing or why, we make shit up. That's what we do. <laughs> Our brain is constantly making you shit up. You are always saying that, Stan. <laughs> it, it, but it's true. No, 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 uh, no. That's the joke. You are always. We make right, shit right, yeah, up. Yeah. It becomes global. <laughs> That's right. That's right. If people could understand how fallible we are at everything in terms of perception, communication, and memory. Uh, we might lose some of the hubris that we have in that I know what I'm thinking is true, or I have a corner on what is fact in terms of memory, um, or I know that, that your look means this. Um, and that's the kind of stuff we're doing all the time, uh, and this is actually what leads us to wars. So then how do we bring the ambassadors in to prevent us from going to war? One way is to bring back novelty, and the only way to do that is to bring back presence and attention. Presence and attention. If you are engaged in some area of importance that's dicey with your partner or friend, be face-to-face, eye-to-eye, straight on, not to the side, because of the way our eyes are, are, uh, are built. We're legally blind on the side. And so right dead on, at close proximity, because we need this part of the brain that, that is checking out faces and looking at the small muscles of the face and the pupils. You have to have all oars in the water and pay attention, not to what you're thinking, not to what you're wanting to do or say, but watch your partner's face. You're now working together and interactively regulating each other's state as you work through things and slow it down, just slow it down. But attention and presence is what brings back a feeling of being in love. Love is through the eyes up close. Lust is at a distance. So lust is at a distance. Love is up close. What happens because we all automate each other mm -hmm. is that we stop paying attention and we stop being present, and we think we know. The answer, at least one answer, is to really go in there. Don't, don't talk about important matters while driving in the car. You'll get into a fight. Don't do it on the phone. You need the eyes. I, I want to I I back, back you up to that last one because I am challenged. I'm challenged with, with heavy topics when I'm driving. I'm also challenged with heavy topics right before going to sleep. They seem of to course. both trigger an amygdala response. Basically, I go, yes. ah, and I don't know why. I'll tell you why. When you're driving, the person who's driving is using resources, which gives them less headroom to be able to handle any spikes in arousal. Any content, any content that's going to come up is going to throw them over into a fight or flight. So driving is a, pr a problem, but also because you're seeing each other through the sides, and I said we're legally blind, we can only see the world in high definition through a tiny, tiny little pinpoint called the, uh, it's part of the macula, it's the fovea, and we need to see the person dead on. When I see your face from the side, my amygdala fires more mm -hmm. because faces at a glance are more threatening. So all, can, all the systems are set for war. If you're in that position with driving included, 
just don't do it. <laughs> it just doesn't, it just won't work. Just like it's a hard time if you have kids and they're sitting in the back seat and they're making all sorts of noise, that's because they're, they're looking straight ahead. There's nobody regulating them because the parents are in the front. So this is just a mechanical, uh, not personal thing. Just be smart about it. Go eye to eye. Don't do anything else. That makes sense. So going from there, let's talk about knowing your partner and about the different styles. And I was, I was fascinated. The anchor, the island, the wave. Maybe you can tell us briefly about each. And I think I don't really like to, to assign something to myself because I, I'm, I'm concerned that I would pigeonhole myself. But it does seem that we have some sort of an island and a wave going on in our family. Yeah. So here's the thing. You know, when I was a, a, a young student, I really hated uh, the DSM. I hated categorizations. I hated diagnoses. I really resented them until I grew up and I understood that as humans, the brain always categorizes. Mm -hmm. We can't get away from it. This is what our mind does. We have to organize things, put them into boxes so that we can figure things out. That's never going to go away. The problem is it's abused. And people take it uh, and, and run with it too much. So the idea here is that, and this comes from attachment research, we've changed the names to protect the innocent. But we changed the names to make them friendlier because if people, if I start talking about, you know, secure autonomous versus angry resistant versus uh, avoidant, um, it, it's a little pejorative. And I think people, it's hard to say as well. So we came up with anchor for secure, mm -hmm. island for, uh, for distancing or avoidant types, and, um, and wave for the clingy or ambivalent or angry resistant type. So it's a little friendlier. What this means is that as we're growing up as children, the family culture is either putting relationships first or other things first. So a family culture that puts relationship first tends to focus on, on, the, on the people in the relationship, and that's the all-important thing. So those families are more concerned about harmony, about people getting along, about knowledge, about care, about nourishment. Um, they can't tolerate breaches in the relationship without having to apologize very quickly. And so these relationships tend to be secure. Add to that the resources available to the parent to track the child, to track the, you know, and that, that, that the, the, the relationships are not overly burdened by fears of abandonment or engulfment, right? I'm free to move. I can move towards you, cling to you without, without shame. I can go away from you without punishment. All of these things are there. Makes me more resilient in life. Sounds like Shangri-La. <laughs> sounds like Shangri-La, but it, it, this does, it's, not a, it's not a unicorn. It does exist. Oh, I'm not uh, picking on it. Uh, Mom, Dad, I love you very much. This would have been a better way to go, perhaps. <laughs> Again, this is, this is, this, you know, it's so funny how we are. Um, you know, w would we yell at the, at the clouds for raining on us? Mm -hmm. No, we might, but the, the clouds don't care. Mm -hmm. And that's been going on forever. And we have no agency there. Just as family cultures, um, this is nature. And so um, we adapt to the environment we have as babies. It's always going to be that way. We adapt to that environment. And if that culture puts a premium on do it yourself, be independent, don't whine, don't need anything, don't complain. I want you to perform perfectly. I want you to look really good for us. And I don't want to be burdened or bothered by your being angry or whiny or whatever like that. Okay, so I'm, I'm making it sound terrible, but you know, this, these are families that are more distant. Mm -hmm. um, and or of coming from a family, let's say a culture where I'm encouraged to care for a parent instead of them caring for me. I have to worry about a parent. Um, I have to um, sacrifice my independence to be sweet, loving, warm, and, de and, and dependent. And, um, and that's rewarded. That's how it goes in my family. I had to take care of mom or dad, whatever. That also gets carried for forward 
as a wave and I start to feel very angry in life because I'm always waiting for something to come to me. I don't have the agency or the right to go and grab it for myself. And so I tend to be negativistic. I pull you towards and push you away because I'm so f- afraid of abandonment and rejection. The island, I pull, you know, I pull you towards you when I first meet you and then I gradually move you away and I claim that I'm feeling smothered, I'm feeling taken over, I've lost myself, you're going to steal my stuff. All these things because of the way the culture was in my family. So that's basically what it is. So we have islandish people. We have wavish people. And these are, uh, these are marked by behaviors, how the people talk, how they move toward and away. Um, these are very definable uh, uh, you know, research elements. But I don't want people to go around saying, you know, you're a wave or you're an island you're, cause, um, because you can't really do that. <laughs> Nobody has that uh, ability to, to, you know, to do that. It takes a lot of testing and sitting down and research to be able to say, okay, you're really that. Makes sense. So I think it's safer to, I think it's safer to say I'm wave-ish. I like that. I like that. And, and, and it could be that I'm, I'm, for instance, I'm wave-ish in rehab. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right, right. You're, you're recovering wave. Yeah, or, or, or in remission. A wave in remission. <laughs> right. There you go. So there let's, go. let's go from there. Let's talk about becoming experts in one another and how to please and soothe our partner. And I think we could all use, I am speaking for myself here, Stan, pleasing and soothing 101. Well, first of all, that's specific to your partner. So we get into here. <laughs> well, I'm just, just going to say, know your partner. Mm-hmm. Because there are a lot of people that will come into treatment with me, and they'll, they'll do their best, you know, their, their best set of soothing, right? This has worked with mom, worked with my girlfriend, worked with my boyfriend. Yep. And it's not working with you. What's the matter with you? Okay, so, um, so this is always tailored to the person you're with, which means you have to study them, which means you have to know your partner. They're not you. And a lot of this is trial and error, learning what actually works, what doesn't work. I can't ask you, you know, um, Michael, every time we get into this whole thing, you get really upset with me. How can I calm you down during that time? Because what you say will be inaccurate. One reason is you don't know. Remember I say we don't know most of these things. We make it up. So we don't know what calms us down. Yeah, no, we don't. And and, uh, and and what happens if you say it is and then it doesn't work? I'm going to blame you. What you told me. Oh. Because... Because this is all state dependent. Mm -hmm. You see, you and I are talking right now. We're fine. But let's say we go into the kitchen and we've been together for a long time and I begin to take your territory in some strange way. We're animals now. We're five-year-olds. It doesn't matter what we know. It doesn't matter how smart and how much uh, therapy we've we've had. We've now just become reduced to this this animalistic five-year-old territorial and everything else goes out the window because it's state dependent. So we have to know what to do when that happens and how to work it in real time. And we're both responsible. So we have to learn about our partner. We have to know how to do it in real time. And, and I would guess that we also need to learn how to do it at all the other times to build up what's in the bank account so that we don't flip <laughs> as far over when we do trip that switch. That's right. I think the main precaution here is not so much that you are going to control your reflexes, which are autonomic sometimes and automatic, um, because those are reflexes. But it's what you do afterwards. Do you fix it quickly? Do you repair it quickly? Do you notice um, what you've done and do you take care of it so it doesn't go into long-term memory? This is very important. The main thing about love, the main thing about security, the main thing about attachment isn't the mistakes we make. It is our effort to make it right. It's all about repair. Always has been, always will be. Those people who refuse to admit their wrongs or take care of of her hurt, even if they weren't in the wrong, are going to suffer this problem. Because if I don't take care of something that hurts you as fast as possible, if I don't lead with relief, that will be remembered for a long time and will come back to me again and again because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. So it's about repair. That's very powerful. Is it... That's a toughie. I mean, that, yeah. because if you don't catch it quickly, so Jessica and I, we have a very good relationship. It's a work in progress like everybody else's, but I'd, I'd argue, and I think she would agree, and she's the producer. She'll let me know if she doesn't agree. It's the best it's ever been. Early on, I was a nutcase, a beautiful nutcase, but mm-hmm. uh, a work in progress. And there are a lot of things that I did that 
triggered long-term responses that we still get to work on now. And so I'm hearing you and I'm thinking of how important it is to nip everything in the bud so it doesn't become a long-term festering problem. That's right. You should, by the way, you should have seen me before I met Tracy, the love of my life. Uh, you know, she pulled me into secure functioning. So I hear you. Um, <laughs> as soon as possible, and here's the thing, if, if you and I are both stewards of that couple bubble, that, that ecosystem, that, um, that environment that we both need to survive and thrive, it's in my best interest to, to do good housekeeping and clean up anything so we don't have anything to look back to. And that's really the thing. So many people are fighting about what happened last week and they're fighting about what happened last month and what happened. And as they're fighting, they're creating new memories to go back to the next week. Um, this would be a little bit like being tossed over by a wave and looking behind you and see how many people saw that you fell. And at, while you're doing that, you're being hit by another wave. So the important thing is, yeah, let's do it now. Let's fix it now. Let's take it off the table now and, and go have fun. So, so this may jump ahead, but if you get into one of those situations that you can clearly see... You, you may have done something wrong now, but this really has to do with what you did years ago and maybe even a compounding of all of that. How do you start to work to diffuse it in the moment once it's triggered? Or is it we're going to have to wait to work on this uh, a little bit later down the road <laughs> when the amygdala is calmed down a little bit? Let me give, an, if I could, maybe this helps and give a little example. Please. Um, it, it occurred to me. Um, uh, that I love Lucy for those people who ever saw it and we're getting into another generation now. Um, but I love Lucy. Did you ever see those shows? She was a genius, genius, brilliant, brilliant, beyond brilliant. And for everybody who hasn't seen her, she was the one when back in the days of black and white TV who brought in the second camera. Nobody had even thought of having a second camera. It was just a straight on shot until she came. She was genius. Cool. She was a genius. And the show Really, if you look at every episode, every episode is about the same thing. Um, we misunderstand each other. We hate each other. We're going we're gonna to leave each other. We, something sweet happens. Now we apologize to each other. We're sorry. We love. We love each other. And that is the, that is the continual system of that show is the mistakes that people make um, that hurt or threaten the other. And they now go off. Uh, and expand and amplify this whole thing until somebody does something friendly, somebody does something sweet, threat comes way down, and now people can think again, and, oh, I'm so sorry for doing that. Yeah, and, oh, and, and the other person says, I'm sorry, too. I was a real idiot. You know, If we could shorten that instead of an hour, <laughs> however long the shows were, I can't remember if they were 30 minutes or an hour, but you know, if we could shorten that to like, like 15 minutes, that would be really cool. I like it. <laughs> um, so the but but basically the exercises in the book mm -hmm. really lead people toward what we're wanting, how to understand secure functioning and whether it's for you or not. I think it's for everybody, but you decide. It's just logic. Um, whether you uh, can understand yourself and your partner as they are, and how to learn this, and how to learn faces, and how to learn when you feel threatened. Uh, and and how you are being threatening without meaning to be because all this is really not on purpose most of it is not on purpose at all um, and so the exercises are exercises are basically teaching people to pay attention to look closely to look at detail and to learn how to be an expert on faces and bodies and movements um, on in nonverbal communication which we did or which we must do with a pet and we must do with a baby because they don't talk Unfortunately, we're cursed with the ability to talk. That makes sense. And, and it really becomes, it goes from, know, it is know thyself, which we don't do very well. So it's know thyself and know thy partner. Maybe even yes. better than we know thyself. So Yes. And there's a reason for that. Oh, go for it. We have in our, uh, in our culture this idea that, that everything we do seems to be in a vacuum without the help of anybody, you know, self-made person. Learn to love yourself before you can love another. You've got to know who you are before you can know somebody. That's absolute horseshit. Now, we know developmentally it's impossible. There's no baby that ever has come into this world that knows itself before <laughs> you know it. <laughs> and there's no baby that comes in to love itself before it's being loved. These things are always done from the outside in first. And then they're and then they're uh, done um, 
uh, at the same time, simultaneously. I learn to love myself as I learn to love you well. I'm not talking about codependency. I learn about myself by knowing you well and by also accepting how, uh, how you see me and what you reflect back to me. This has always been a two-person phenomena. It's not done in a cave. It's not done by yourself. It never will be. So I just want to correct for the record that that, that is why um, we're, we're obeying the laws of nature of the human brain uh, and our legacy that, it, that we are interactional human beings. We cannot do things alone. We don't do much very well alone. And if you think you are, then again, you're not, you're not really paying attention. One of the groomsmen at our wedding used to say to me, uh, uh, his name's Hendrik, awesome guy, and he would say, dude, you were nowhere without her, referring to Jessica. And he <laughs> was right. <laughs> But I'm sure, Jess, I'm sure your wife would say the same thing, right? Because if she doesn't, then there's something to talk about because I bet there's no way you don't perform in a similar fashion if you guys are happy and you sound like you are. Yeah. It has to be that way. Yeah. And, and I guess it is nature really brings us together so that we can elevate both of our games. So yeah. let's, let's go from there. You had a, a beautiful article in, I think it was Mind Body Green on this. You have a beautiful section in your book on it, launchings and landings and how to use morning bedtime ritual, morning and bedtime rituals. And w we've got in this house a little bit of an early bird and a night owl. So I was wondering if you can tell us about all this good stuff. Who's the night owl? Uh, she's the night owl. So, and it's okay, a relative thing. She's only a night owl by an hour, hour or two. But right. um, I tend to be a real early bird's early bird, and it's a challenge. The biggest challenge that we run into isn't her. It's my own personal hang-up, which is if she wants to go bed later, I end up going to bed later, not because she's keeping me up. That's the excuse, but because I can't get my own habits as dialed in as I'd like because the person I love is still up. Again, it's an excuse. Right. This is all excuses. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty is charged. Well, the, the, uh, the premise here uh, is that most of what ails us in relationship is centered around separations and reunions. Now, now a lot of people are conscious of this. A lot of people are not. They, you know, the people who are not sensitive to this don't think much of it, but they are being affected. Everyone is affected by separations and reunions. So mourning is a reunion in a sense, right? Because you're waking up from unconsciousness. You're, you know, you're coming back into the day like a birth. And the person that you're with is you know, you're greeting each other. You're shepherding each other. You're energizing, resourcing each other to face the day. And so whether that's just a kiss or looking at each other, gazing at each other, having breakfast, coffee, whatever it is, the send off really makes a big difference in terms of how you face the day, mm -hmm. knowing that you're tethered to somebody. I'm not alone. My partner is with me in spirit. Now, going to sleep is a huge separation. Uh, it's also a reunion, too, because many of us come home. We're reuniting. If we're very busy with kids and other matters, the reunion could really suck which is why we recommend that when people come in from outside, inside, outside, home, not home, that they formalize their reunion before the kids, before the pets, because they're the roof of the house. They're the major regulators, the big bells. Everyone else is ringing to them. It makes sense that they average each other's nervous systems out by embracing each other or gazing each other and making sure that each other's eyes are relaxed. Okay, so this, I'm not doing it for myself. I'm looking at you, your eyes, you're still thinking about something, soften your eyes, you do that with me. Now we're set to go, we separate. Bedtime mm -hmm. for kids and for adults. For kids, they need the transition time. It's a scary time. It still is for adults. That's why there are a lot of adults out there that will stay up until they pass out because they can't tolerate the period from absolute wakefulness to sleep. Um, they need to be active. So putting each other to bed um, and not, as you put it, talking about stressful things or th big issues about the f relationship that is stressful. It is aggravating because you're now getting ready to close the day and go to sleep, not ready to get into something that will never end. So it has to be uh, light, um, pillow talk, prayer, 
um, listening to a podcast together, reading to each other, making you know letters on each other's backs. I don't care what it is, but you're putting each other to bed because it sets the tone for the sleeping part of the evening. Um, your sleep is going to be better, and it sets up the next day. I'm just dumbfounded that I'm making this connection now, which is I have my, my uh, Think and Grow Rich journal next to me. So I try to journal each night to program my subconscious to keep working for me through the night to help bring about what I want about in life. What I've never thought of is that the most important programming that I can be doing them all is the couple's programming before bedtime. This is, this is a, uh, a light has gone on here, Stan, moment. <laughs> It, there's so many. Thank you. I, you know, I, I've only known you for a few minutes, Michael. I already love you. <laughs> it goes both ways, Dan. I'm looking at the clock and how much time we have left. And I'm going, I'm not going to want this one to end. <laughs> so there's so many things that people can do at night. One is to wish people well, dead or alive. Uh, it's a kind of version of a, a loving kindness meditation. But it's uh, instead of counting sheep, you just let whoever floats to mind and you wish them well. Or together, you wish the people well that you saw through the day. A uh, lot of things you can do. Now, if one of you wants to stay up later, allow the other person to go to sleep with you there, and then once they're asleep, get up and do what you're going to do. Uh, chances are you'll fall asleep anyway. But if you don't, that's fine. As long as that, as long as you're closing the day with, uh, with the, at least the one of you, um, and you're involved as well. Beautiful. Yeah. So, so let's go from there, and let's talk real briefly about fighting. Um, <laughs> not how to do this well. <laughs> Actually, I guess the best way to fight well is how do we learn how to let the other partner win? Rather than that, it's really um, it, it, secure functioning couples who are truly invested in collaboration and mutuality um, always go for win-win situations. They take longer. They take more effort. But that is how we roll because we don't want to create any inequity, any feelings of resentment moving forward because we'll pay for that. So you and I have to move together in a certain way. So one of the ways we fight, um, and this is given that we're not, you know, uh, completely out of, uh, you know, into the primitives and into kill mode. Um, but in, a, in, a, in an argument, in, uh, uh, in, you know, in that system, it only works if I take care of myself and you simultaneously. Now, a lot of people think that's weird, and how do you do that? But it actually is done all the time in, in heavy-duty negotiations. I have to take care of myself and you at the same time, or I get nothing. That means I have to know what you want. I have to know what you're afraid of. I have to know what bothers you about what I'm going to do. All of that stuff has to be laid out so that you can relax knowing that I've got your back and I know what your, your interests are before I press mine. Um, the other thing is it has to stay friendly because when we start to get into a fight, we start to see each other as predators. And our brain has changed. That means that nothing gets heard, nothing gets listened to. In fact, what gets remembered is stupid that people say when they're in the state. So um, nothing good comes from being in that state. So we want to uh, pull it back, wave a flag of friendliness. I love you. By the way, I'm not trying to attack you, and I know you are sensitive to attack, and I don't mean to do that. I want to um, pause you right there and, and repeat that because we got to we got to downregulate fast. What? Go into waving Absolutely. the flag of friendliness in, in more detail for us to really soak that one in. Absolutely. Waving the fra flag of friendliness sometimes is lowering the art of lowering yourself, you know, lowering yourself or even getting on the floor, um, but or moving forward or or um, a smile, but an, a smile that also says, um, you know, I this is not against you. I think you're. The greatest thing since sliced, sliced turkey, I so admire the things you do, but I am really angry with you about this thing. So that you're leading with relief, which doesn't arouse the primitives to a threat. Don't forget, if I'm in a system or am I, I'm in a conversation with you that I know is tense, um, I'm prepared to be attacked. I am prepared um, for the same thing to happen again. The only thing that would dismantle that preparation or that anticipation would be you doing something to show me that I needn't worry. Um, and then you, then you fight. So, uh, you know, this is a game where both people have to be up. If one gets knocked down, game over. Um, so we have to make sure that we're okay and then fight some more with a common goal to get to mutual relief as quickly as possible. 
What's at the, mutual relief as quickly as possible. What's the importance of going quiet or what you call shutting up at these times? It, it depends. If shutting up means to keep yourself from saying something stupid that's going to just cause more trouble, then yeah, do it. If shutting up means that you're shutting down or you're withdrawing or you're angry, that's not a good thing because a neutral face is always read as negative. So if I just sit there and go, uh-oh, <laughs> there, 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 is, there is no way you're going to imagine that what I'm thinking or feeling is positive. Mm -hmm. um, your brain, we, all of our brains have a negativity bias. When in doubt, we go negative. When we can't see, we go negative. So you don't want to just sit still with a blank face and be quiet. But that's different from stifling yourself from saying something that's going to be incendiary. That's going to make it worse and not get me to my goal and not get us to mutual relief. It's fascinating. We did a, uh, a book tour. It's a miracle we're still together. We did a, I don't even remember, 100 and some odd cities and like five month book tour in this tiny little Suzuki uh, compact thing where we took the back seats out for the dogs. And, and we're, we're driving along like, like lunatics all across the country, the two of us, GPS blaring, got to get to the talk. We're running late. And, and I, I, if she put on her sunglasses, Oh, good. And I couldn't see her eyes. Yeah. It was my wiring, I guess, from my childhood, but I assume that she's glaring at me just because right. I can't see what's going on with the face. That's right. If your t audience does not take home anything from today, just know that our brains are constantly filling in the blanks all the time. If you leave t things too much blank, you get what you deserve because your partner or your friends or whatever, they're going to fill it in with something you don't want. So, so express, say what you think, say, fill in the gaps, show the eyes. Don't do that because you're asking for trouble because our minds will just make up what we don't know. Speaking of acting, and, and thank you, I think that's so important. On, on that note, filling in the blanks, what's the perils of digital fighting? Because I think things can <laughs> really spin out of control there. It's, it's amazing. I mean, there, there are digital masters, people who are really good together, but they generally are good face to face too. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there's some people who are terrible face to face and they rather write letters to each other, but I still think that's a terrible idea because you still have to reckon with the face to face. That's daily life. You can't get away by just simply writing your thoughts. And besides, sometimes you don't want that on paper, uh, as a record because some people write stupid things. So it's better to do it live in person, face to face eye to eye, uh, people who are texting emotions, trying to get out of things, trying to clear the record, they're going to get into trouble every time because of, again, the blankness. Our mind makes up what it cannot hear, see, feel, and here you're reading it, and if your mood is such that you've just gotten off out of a, a session with your boss that's yelled at you and you see something neutral from your lover, you could read it as negative. And so... Not a good idea. Face-to-face, eye-to-eye, that's the only way to go. Oh, this sounds like the Japanese. Face-to-face, eye-to-eye, and belly-to-belly. Belly-to-belly. And you know why it's belly-to-belly? -belly? Um, I think a sumo wrestler is, but go for it. Tell me. I mean, it's, it's, it's a term they use for negotiation. So, so what, what is belly-to-belly? -belly? Well, we want, when people hug, we want them to press their bellies together because um, th this, th they're, Areas that are extremely vulnerable on the human being, and one of them actually is the belly. And that's because it houses our guts, which is why we go into a fetal position to protect our guts. So when you, and we also have all these serotonin receptors in the gut. When you press uh, each other, um, it actually calms us down. It shuts off what's called the, uh, the stress, the hormone stress system, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system. It shuts it off. And so, so there's something to that, uh, belly to belly. It's it's putting. I, I can sense it now, and I'm getting that parasympathetic, ah, <laughs> going belly to belly. In fact, that brings us into into the last main topic that we'll probably cover here today: is do we all need to be touched? Yeah, we do. This is a, a problem because there are people among us who really are averse to touch. Some of them have been abused. Yeah. Um, and some were never touched much as infants and children, and so they have an aversion to the near senses. In other words, smell, touch, taste, the gustatory, um, um, uh, and near vision. So, uh, so, but we know that 
at the top of the heap in terms of what influences our bodies, our nervous systems. At the very, very top, it's touch. A very near second is vision. And then we have audition, prosody, the tone of the voice, and then, and then smell. So, so touch is extremely important um, for regulating our internal state and particularly shutting off the stress system because if it's on too long, uh, it causes wear and tear on all systems of the, of the body. Uh, we get sicker sooner. We develop all sorts of illnesses. So it's extremely important. Um, touch of, of any kind. And I think hugging, like I said, belly to belly, is one of the best things. I have been in, a, 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 there was a time I was in a terrible, terrible mood, awful mood. I didn't want to see anybody. We were going to a party, mostly my, fr- my wife's friends. Even though I like them very much, I was feeling stranger danger suddenly. And I was sitting in my car just pretending to work when she, you know, she covered for me, when I was just basically taking my time because I didn't want to go inside. I went inside. The first person that saw me hugged me. We hugged. It was a good old hug. I started noticing I'm feeling better. The second person, we hugged and everything. I'm really feeling better. It took about four hugs, and I was completely myself. Woohoo! <laughs> and, and I and I and I'm I'm a skeptic. I became a true believer after that. And I said, and, you know, there's something to the hug thing. Uh, it really does something to change your state, which changes your perceptions, which changes your memory, by the way, and changes everything. I, I love it. I'm a hugger. In fact, everybody that we work with, I say, what's the huggability factor is what I say to my wife. Because if the huggability factor isn't there, then we're not going to be able to relate quite that way. Um, a, a note on this, which is when my, um, when my adrenaline system, when my, when my primitives are in overload, and it's not actually a dis- disagreement between my wife and myself, auditory is completely clamped shut. Visual isn't that great. But if my wife, we, we learned this maybe from the movie on Temple Grandin. We learned um, yeah. that if she would go to my head, she first found this device in the Philippines, this head scratcher, and would run it up and down on my head. Now she knows she can do it with her fingers, putting her fingers through my hair. All of a sudden... Hmm. Yeah. Ah. That's and 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 that there is what we want people to do is discover these little Easter egg things, the things that actually cool. work with our partners, so that when it's necessary, we know what to do. We know how to minister to our partners, and that's great. What she beautiful, does, beautiful. She Jessica always likes me to ask before the end if there are any words of wisdom that you would have to give parents for our kids or for taking care of our kids, either way? Well, because I'm, I'm big on couples and I see that, I see that the state of the union um, is what affects the children because that they're the roof of the house, the couple. The couple has to remain, and you know, if it's, if it's same sex, girlfriend and girlfriend, boyfriend and boyfriend, boyfriend and girlfriend. Not just because, not, you know, you may be married, you may be parents, but you got to remain boyfriend and girlfriend because that is the purpose of having the children in the first place. That is the reason for being. If that is, if that system isn't intact, if you're not taking good care of each other, if you're not happy, and you're not in love, your kids will suffer. We know this. So, um, so it really starts at the top. It starts and ends at the top. And even if you haven't been great, there's always time. As soon as the parents, as soon as the couple system, as soon as that couple does well at handling each other, t- being in each other's care, everything changes right away. The kids change. Even adult children change because the, the, the parents, the couple, they're always the leader. This would be a topic for a whole interview unto itself, but, but the question becomes, how do we shift the, um, I don't know if priority, emphasis, all of the above, how do we shift that from a, I must take care of the baby first, to a, I must take care of us first to be able to have the support to take care of the baby? Um, this is a tough thing to get across because it's a very emotional issue that's attached to an individual's psychology as well as the prevailing uh, ideas in the culture. It's very hard to get this out without people misunderstanding, but the couple 
the system has to come first. That doesn't mean you lock your kid into a closet. It doesn't mean that you leave your kid crying because you have to take care of each other first. No. It means that in the spirit of things, that you are king and queen of the land. You are the grand poobahs. You are the moon, the sun, the earth, everything to what everyone below and around you. You are a mini society. What you do affects everybody. And if you don't have your act together, if you're not doing well with each other, if you don't know how to handle each other, nothing goes well. It's, it's like the king and queen are not in good order. The land is feral, is you know barren. Um, and so uh, think of it that way, that you, you have to do this. This is not uh, an option. You have to do this um, if you really want to, uh, to have healthy children. We know this. That children need to see their parents in love. In order for them to feel happy, they need to see that their parents are not in trouble. They don't need to be thought of. They don't have to be worried about. It will absorb all the kids' resources, and we know what that's like, and they won't be able to be kids, and you'll see them in therapy very soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm thinking from a little baby's perspective, if you see your parents in love, life is good because then you've got this, this foundation, and if they ain't in love, you ain't got anything. Right. And you don't and you can be a kid. You don't have to take care of them. They're they're doing just fine. Woo! So with that said, a question we like to ask just before the end to all of our guests is what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? Oh, golly. There's so many things. I mean, my family is is one. I don't know if it gives me the woohoo, but it gives me the Ah, feeling just being around my daughter and my wife. Um, what gives me the wahoo feeling, I think, is the um, the work that I do and the people that I work with. Um, they inspire me. They truly do. I love what I do, and when I'm able to get this message across and it does help people, that's a big wahoo. And also, as I get older, because of this work of really paying attention and being present, there is something about them. Remember I said, the eyes is where we fall in love, being up close, being able to be very present and very attentive. We tend to fall in love very easily. I find myself loving people more and more as I get older, and this is a big woohoo for me. And I would give that a big woohoo as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a big so woohoo. From there, where can people go to find out more? <laughs> to find your beautiful book. And what I didn't say is there's so many great exercises and things to do in this book that are going to really help you to learn about you and learn about your partner. I know Jessica's already going. I can hear her in the background, so to speak, going, what have you learned from this book? I actually took away a lot from this book, and I've read a lot of couples books. So where can people go to find out more, to find your book? And you also mentioned a uh, Shambhala event coming up. Right. The Shambhala event, I'm looking down at my notes here, is September 16th through 18th at the Shambhala Mountain Center in uh, Colorado. We're doing Wire for Love, the mm -hmm. book. Uh, the re it's a couple retreat my wife and I do with our faculty as well. We're in uh, Omega, but that's sold out. But we'll be in Shambhala. And you can find me at Stan. Tatkin.com. That's my, you know, the page to find me. Um, if you're interested in our institute, which is worldwide, we train therapists in, in uh, this psychobiological method. It's thepactinstitute.com. And there you can get a schedule of our events and so on. Um, the other books, by the way, some people really love Your Brain on Love, which is on audio only. That's me riffing for several hours. And then the newest book, uh, Wired for Dating, for those who want to get into the game. Fantastic. And you have a fantastic, another way to put it, you have a great voice for riffing. So um, <laughs> very calming, very, very good on all the primitives. Um, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people before? And do you have time for a short meditation? I will say this. Um, secure functioning, which is basically putting relationships first, is not only important for the couple, but we really believe it's important for the world. We believe that this is something that's in our capacity to do, to be fair, to be just, to be sensitive, to work collaboratively, to be truly mutual. Um, uh, we think, we know this is uh, our capacity to do. It's also our capacity to think only of ourselves and to take only our interests in mind, which leads to wars. But, you know, we're hoping to push this message of secure functioning to people um, as we go. 
thank you, and I couldn't agree more when, whenever people talk about elections coming out, this candidate, that candidate, the state of affairs of the world. Yeah. I'm always like it's going to start by healing our own hearts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank most you. definitely. You're thank welcome. You. So did you have a, uh, a brief meditation or a couple's meditation that you'd like to share with us? Yes. Um, sitting with your partner, it doesn't have to be your lover, it could be your good friend, it doesn't matter. Um, but if it is your lover, good too. Um, sit either cross-legged uh, or on a zafu, but whatever you want to do on a chair with your eyes at the same eye level. And keep your eyes open. I know many of you have done this. Jack Kornfield has done this. It's been an exercise. Probably cavemen did it. Who knows? But nothing new here. But what is new is I'd like you to just focus on your partner visually. Okay, We're using the visual system. And you're going to sweep your body every now and then for muscle tension. So get yourself seated. Now, there's several meditations to do here. I'm just going to do one very, very quickly. Perfect. So get yourself settled in a chair. Close your eyes. And allow yourself to just settle. And if there's any gross muscle tension, just gently let it go if you can. And you may be aware of sounds in the background, sounds around you. You may be aware of thoughts rising and fading. But for right now, I'd like you to just focus on body sensation. The feeling of air temperature against your skin. Clothing against your skin. Sensation of your bottom against a chair or the floor or a zafu. Any and all sensations. And as you do so, continue to let go of any muscle tension, relax. See if you can drop it or simply let it be. And in a moment, I'm going to have you open your eyes and look into the eyes of your partner But I want you to notice what changes in your body in anticipation for looking at your partner. Change in breath. New tensions that arise. Perhaps a feeling of your heart beating. And now I'd like to like you to open your eyes and simply direct all your visual attention to your partner's eyes and face. Make sure to relax any new tensions that arise. as you use as your object of meditation your partner's face.
thoughts about yourself, thoughts about the exercise, Let them rise, but keep your attention. On your partner's face. Always be sure to let go of any new tensions that arise, but keep your focus outward. As you carefully examine your partner's face, as if nothing else exists, And as you do this, I'd like you to notice every time you see a change or a shift anywhere on your partner's face. This includes the neck, includes the ears, includes the pupils. And every time you notice a change, I'd like you to gently tap with one finger on your own leg to note change, change, change. Note every instance of a change in your partner's face by gently tapping and saying to yourself quietly, change. If your attention begins to change to yourself or your own thoughts, redirect it again to your partner's face. And gently noting every shift, every change by tapping your finger. In a moment, I'm going to introduce words And with each word, I'd like you to just notice what changes on your partner's face. Puppies. Trump. Remember to relax your body when new tensions arise and keep your eye on the ball. 
noting every shift or change in your partner's face. Roller coaster. Cancer. Orgasm. Forgiveness. Friendship. Collaboration. Divorce. Baby. Love. Service. Okay, close your eyes again and just go back inside your body. This is a very abbreviated version of what you could do together. But notice what changes with your eyes closed. Is it better? Is it worse? Is it the same? And again, accelerating this exercise beyond what it should be. Open your eyes and just talk to each other about what this was like and what you experienced. Now, I threw something in there that is done when I'm uh, working with people by introducing words so that people can get a sense of what the face does with the first splash of a vision or and of an idea. Um, and that's the reason for uh, positive images and negative Im images um, uh, to evoke a feeling that even can be seen a little bit through micro expression and to teach people to, uh, to, to find the face uh, as fascinating as it is. I don't think people realize for, for mammals, the face is the main organ. It's the social organ. Every, you know, if people think about it um, from babyhood to adulthood, there's something about being able to touch the face, to see the face, touch the face that makes the other person friendly and approachable. If we could all touch a lion with, with assurance that the lion would never do anything to us, I'm sure most of us would want to touch that lion's face or that bear's face. There's something hardwired into the mammalian brain where the face is, is extremely important. Um, for safety and for love. 
Stan, as someone who's practiced uh, gazing eye to eye with Jessica more in the past than recently, and I think you've just rekindled that <laughs> again now, this is powerful. It's this powerful. Is and, and you can even, with both hands, you can explore each other's faces while sitting across from each other like you did as babies. Uh, Margaret Mahler called it customs inspection. It's our fascination with the face and particularly being able to touch it. And it's one way to also kindle, rekindle those early feelings you had when you first discovered your partner. Woohoo! <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much, Stan. This has been Thanks, thank you. a fantastic interview. Everybody, get wired for love. You're going to love it. I can't thank you enough. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well. Have fun, get wired for love, and build that relationship face to face and belly to belly. <laughs> and shine bright. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. You're a dear. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> this was fantastic. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, InspireNationShow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>